Welcome friends to another r slash nuclear revenge video. If you enjoy these tales of powerful revenge, make sure to join in by hitting the like and subscribe buttons down below. That said, our first story of the day is by V Navigator. Father attempting to murder puppies leads to his own faked murder. This is my uncle's story, not mine. My uncle Mike used to have a friend that we'll call Jim. Jim owned a quiet mechanic shop at the beginning of a dead-end dirt road. Many people would drive down the road, dump things, and drive back by the shop. Jim and Mike would often sit in front of the shop and keep an eye on people driving by, as there would be some shady characters out there sometimes. In front of the shop, the road had a bridge that went over a river. One day, a family driving by stopped on the bridge. Jim and Mike's attention was alerted by children absolutely screaming from inside the car. They watched as the father, who was also the driver, threw a sack from the bridge into the river, then sped off down the dirt road. They saw that the bag was moving and immediately sprung into action, climbed down the embankment, and grabbed it. Inside the bag were seven tiny live puppies. Jim was a dog lover and was not having this. He knew that since the road was a dead-end road, the family would have to drive back by. He grabbed his shotgun and stood in the middle of the road, waiting. They pulled up and he had the gun drawn. They stopped and he ordered the father out of the car. The mother and two small children were terrified. He then marched the father down to the riverbank, out of sight of his family. He then screamed at the father for a good 10 minutes about animal abuse, his poor parenting skills, and some other choice not-so-nice words, then for good measure, fired a shot into the ground. This shot was heard by the family waiting in the car. Their eyes went wide and the kids started screaming again. The mother started crying and shrieking. It was another two to three minutes before the father walked back up to the car, completely fine and uninjured. I'm not agreeing with the actions here, but that sure was some revenge. Also, screw puppy murderers. I wholeheartedly agree with OP's last sentence here. You can't really condone the kind of action that was going on here, especially traumatizing the kids and wife. But if somebody is so cruel as to willingly throw a bag of live puppies off a bridge into the water down below, I ain't saying they deserve it, but they kind of deserve it. This next story is by Being Jack. She didn't give me my money back, so I ruined her life. I don't know if this is the right sub, but here we go. I'm male, 20, strongly believe in individualism and equality, currently in university. Jada, fake name, is probably under 24 and a clerk in a government bank. A good accomplishment for middle class Indians. We're both neighbors, live with our parents. It's normal and sort of compulsory in India, especially in small towns. We're neighbors for around 8 years. Our parents have okay relations with each other, and I have a good relation with her parents, and okay relation with Jida. We're both lower economical middle class, and socially from upper caste. Both her parents are liberal in the Indian sense, but in Western standards, they're very conservative. You can say this for the majority of Indian parents. February 2019, I had to deposit 112 US dollars. It's a large amount for lower middle class Indians. In the bank. I'm sort of lazy and didn't want to wait in queues in the bank. Also, Jita was in the same bank, so I thought I'd give her the money and she would deposit that in my account. I went to her house at 7 a.m. and called for her mother. She opened the gate. It turned out that her elder brother, 28, and mother and father went to temple. I told her why I came. She accepted the money and told me that she would keep the hard cash and transfer the money from her account the next day. Two weeks later, the money was still not deposited. I asked her about this several times, mainly from WhatsApp, but she just made excuses. At last, after three weeks, I went to her house and asked her to give the money instantly. I threatened her that I would tell her parents. After hearing that, she said this, What proof do you have that you gave me the money? Ask for money again, and I'll tell everybody that you're sexually harassing me. That was it. I became stiff as stone. My whole body became too heavy suddenly. I really had no proof. And I had WhatsApped her several times saying, Money hasn't been deposited yet, or... When will you deposit the money? Now, before any of you Western folks say that I exaggerated the situation, you have to view the situation through an innocent Indian person. India is basically the Middle East in terms of sex, personal space, and sexism. Google two-finger test in India. Also, legally, men can't be R-worded. But unlike the Middle East, it hides this fact through white lies. 
India has an assault problem, and this causes false accusation problems too. I've heard many false sexual harassment and R-word accusation cases, and have personally seen my distant rich cousin assault his neighbor due to land dispute violently. He simply used his beautiful clerk to charge him with a false sexual harassment case. The case ended with the neighbor being in jail for some time. Both my cousin and his neighbor had to bribe the police. June 2019, I hadn't talked with her again after that, but I had a plan to revenge her. By this time, I'd spied on her a bit and found out that she buys alcohol every alternating Saturday from X place and drinks it in her friend's place. Drinking alcohol is seen as immoral in the male population and 10 times as immoral in the female population in India. Also, she has a boyfriend, under 25, with whom she spends half an hour every Saturday evening with at X Park, which is on the other side of town. Having a boyfriend and girlfriend is seen as immoral in India, and you won't even get a rental flat easily if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend. I took photos of her both with her boyfriend and buying alcohol. First Saturday, July 2019, that day on my way to the park, I found a police SUV a mile away from the park. I thought maybe it's time to get this plan a step further. I told them that a couple's doing obscene acts in so-and-so park. The police officer replied in a very rude language. I knew I had to pay him, so I gave him 2,000 Indian rupees and he agreed to go. The park Jita used to go to was famous for unmarried couples, so in every Valentine's Day, the police used to harass the couples there. Upon reaching there, I told them the spot and began to watch the situation from a distance. I wasn't able to hear them, but the view was clear. Jita and her boyfriend were neither kissing nor hugging, they were just talking on the bench at that time. The police arrived and told them something. After that, the police slapped Jita's boyfriend a few times immediately. It appeared her boyfriend refused to give his parents' number. In India, if a police officer caught an under 30 unmarried couple, they demanded the victim's parents' numbers. The whole drama went on for 20 minutes. Both of them even fell to the police's feet. At last, they had to give some money to the police. This police behavior is pretty normal in India. Both looked pretty terrified that day. For Sunday, July 2019, I had already printed out all the images in 10 groups, because there's 10 main houses in the neighborhood, including mine. In each set, there were three images of her buying alcohol and four images of her and her boyfriend together. I woke up at 4 a.m. and put all the sets of pictures in front of the 10 houses and went to sleep. I woke up with loud noises from Jita's house. I'd put one set in front of my own house too. I'm pretty sure her brother slapped her a few times. Her mother was calling her bad names like Randy, Hindi word for promiscuous. Her father was not in the house that day. I asked my mother about the situation and she told me to stay away from Jita. She told me that Jita had shamed the whole society with her childish behavior. August 1st, 2019, and the last month she was forced to stay in the house by her parents. The whole neighborhood was disgusted by her and her parents also charged a blackmailing case on Jita's boyfriend, which caused her boyfriend to spend a few days in jail, but he was released after a week. Her parents also tried arranging a marriage for her. It turned out that her boyfriend was from lower caste, which fueled the rage even more. She also needed a stitch on her lips because her brother literally cut her upper lip in half. September 15th, 2019, she'll be married next year. She had started going to the bank again. I still haven't gotten the money. So obviously, these cultures and living arrangements and just situations in general very greatly from what I'm used to. That said, considering everything that happened to Jita in this story, do you think that was more than enough revenge for never paying OP back what was supposedly a large sum of money? Let me know in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by FancyCat11, Miss Nice Girl has left the building. First, I need to explain something. I seem like a very nice, laid-back, easy-going person, so most people make the mistake of thinking I'm a spineless wimp they can take advantage of. Operative word there is seem. In point of fact, I have a vicious, vindictive temper. I'm just emotionally lazy. I don't like wasting time and energy on confrontation that can more profitably be spent elsewhere. However, if you mess with my family or my money, very bad things will happen to you. As my mom liked to say, Miss Nice Fancy has left the building. 
and you don't want to meet the other fancy. Example follows. This happened about 20 years ago. I started working as a CAD drafter for a small drafting and design firm, practically fresh out of college. I made a good salary, not great but comfortable. Very soon, I found myself the drafter, receptionist, office manager, file clerk, and even janitor when I needed to pick up a little extra money. My boss was almost never in the office because I was there to handle everything. After a year of being general factotum, on Friday, April 13th, my boss came to me and tells me he doesn't have my income tax paperwork ready, but has a reasonable excuse, and he asks me to file an extension. I told him, this is kind of last minute, don't you think? But okay, I'll do it. And I did. Every couple of weeks afterward, I'd ask him about my tax paperwork, and he'd tell me, no, not yet, and umpteen excuses, why not? Finally, he told me his lawyer had them and was finishing preparing them and would be ready any day. Really? I did wonder why his lawyer was working on them instead of his accountant, but I didn't say anything. My tax extension would be up on Sunday, July 15th, so I had to turn in my taxes by Saturday, July 14th. On Friday, July 13th, about 5 p.m., I was sitting in my office chatting with my mom, who was there to give me a ride home. My boss came into my office and had the gall to ask me to file another tax extension and gave me some totally bogus excuse. You see, what he didn't know was, I had found all my tax paperwork on his computer a few weeks before, just needed to be printed out and signed off. So I knew then that he'd been lying his butt off this whole time. I remember staring at him for a few moments, absolutely dumbfounded, then smiling and saying okay. My mom told me afterward, when she saw me smile at him like that, she thought, oh crap, Fancy's gonna kill this guy, and I don't know if I can stop her. I'm sure he wishes that's all I'd done to him. First thing Monday morning, I walked straight up to my boss and dropped my resignation on his desk. He's like, what the heck? And tried to argue. Me, I don't argue. I just told him, I'm leaving, do you want me to work my notice? He said, heck no, get your stuff and get out which was another huge mistake in a long line of them because I left and went straight to the IRS office where I gave up all the goods on this guy. He apparently never actually paid any of my taxes or his, though he did take it out of my pay and I had proof. It so happens before he was a CAD drafter and designer, he was a CPA who left that field under a cloud. The IRS was not happy to hear his name again. Everybody knows you do not mess with the IRS. Not content with that, I then contacted all of his business associates and told them what he had done. That he was being investigated by the IRS, and if they didn't want to be too, they might want to steer clear. I didn't tell his wife, whom I was on very good terms with, but only because I wanted him to have that pleasure. Just picture that conversation. Oh my god, why did OP leave? OP did everything. Um, well, I'm very sure she heard all about it from his associates. I'll give him this. He was stubborn. He managed to hang on to his business for about a year of living heck before going under. But I smirked every time I went by his empty office. To clarify, I never printed the tax paperwork from his computer. It honestly never occurred to me to do so. I used my own records of what I was paid and what tax was taken out of my salary to go to the IRS with. Since it was all in his handwriting, they accepted it. I was really just trying to give this guy the chance to do the right thing right up to the end. Or hang himself, whichever. It just kind of blows my mind that there's somebody that is willing to wait literally like a day before the last possible day to turn in your taxes and come in and say, hey, could you get an extension? and then repeat that again and say, could you get another extension? Like somehow just hoping that they would get away with it? Like eventually something's going to hit the fan because you're not giving the information to OP. Like are they hoping that OP would have just, I don't know, eventually just not did their taxes? I don't know what the actual exit plan here for this guy was. I think it was honestly a pretty doomed plan from the get go. Maybe they were trying to last till they could afford their plane ticket to Cuba. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. 
Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.